saints? Oh, okay. All right. All right. All right. We just wanted to make sure that you were here. Oh, cancel. I like these things and I don't like these things. You know what I mean? Electronic stuff. It's, uh, um, yeah. Well, well, well. It's good to worship the Lord. Yeah, no matter what kind of a day you have, what kind of a month you may have had today, it's always good to worship the Lord. Let's, let's go before him again and, and ask him to just bless us now with uh, understanding his word. Lord, we thank you for your great love for us. And in light of the Psalms we're looking at tonight, Lord God, you are so well acquainted with our afflictions, our needs, our hurts, and our pains. We ask that, Lord, you would settle our hearts tonight, and that we would hear you. We need to hear from you. Your word is a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. Lord, the way of life is above to the righteous, that we may depart from the ways of death. And we see that, Lord, even the best of saints are still men, still fallen, still flawed. And you've preserved, Lord, your word. Give us understanding. Let us not just gather here tonight casually, half-heartedly, but fully engaged, Lord, knowing that when you call your children to your table, no matter what season it is, you always fill us and feed us with that manna that we need. And you know exactly what we need tonight, Lord. And for those watching online, grant it to us. And again, Lord, I hide behind your cross. There's nothing that I can say, nothing that I can do. Lord, it's your spirit, only your spirit, that illuminates, gives life, gives breath, gives hope, convicts, reproves, corrects. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 38. Psalm 38 is one of the seven penitential psalms. And they're psalms that are an expression of sorrow for sin. And this particular psalm is an explicit confession of David's personal sin against God. He tells us in verses 1, verses 3, and verses 18 about this. And there is a physical affliction that David had suffered, acquainted with the sin, that is not recorded anywhere in Samuel or in Chronicles, but he sees fit under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to record it for you and for me to read tonight. This psalm, according to some, not all Jewish traditions, is read on Yom Kippur. It is a song of remembrance. And David says, O Lord, and he uses Jehovah there, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten or discipline or correct me in thy hot displeasure. Now, right there, note that David admitted that he deserved to be disciplined. He says, Lord, don't do it in your wrath. Don't do it in your hot displeasure. He wants mercy. And God's discipline in our lives when we sin and come to him is always meant to soften our heart and ultimately restore us, rekindle that fellowship with him. And fellowship with others that may have been broken because of that sin. Notice how David describes this particular situation. Verse 2, For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. So there was, there was a, a degree of heaviness that weighed upon David. He describes his physical condition as arrows sent by God. That's the exact same way that it was spoken of 
to Job in chapter 6 and in chapter 16. And David now is feeling the weight of the conviction. The piercing effect is evidence of his conviction of sin. I read this comment and I forgot where it came from, but this is so powerful. If conviction of sin horrified sinners like David and you and me, what must it have been for, been like for Jesus Christ to experience the guilt of mankind's sins and iniquities that were placed upon him? Never forget Calvary. Never. David says, There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest, no peace in my bones because of my sin. And so David is physically, mentally, emotionally going through a very, very difficult time. No rest, no rest in his bones. Now, although not all physical illness is due to sin, there are verses that tell us that sometimes there is physical illness that is acquainted with sin. And here is a case. David has this physical illness, and he knows that it's because of some sin that he had committed in his life. What it was, we don't know, and we can only speculate. But David is really, really suffering under the weight of, of, of God's conviction, and, and his sin is, is now getting the best of him. You know, when you and I sin, sin is not through with us. It just keeps on eating away. And even though David is showing repentance and remorse, still the consequences of this particular situation, we don't know how long it was, but David is suffering. He says in verse 4, Mine iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. The Reformation Study Bible has in note the imagery of physical and medical harm, though perhaps reflecting the circumstances of divine discipline point deeper to painful conviction of sin from God upon his conscience. My iniquities are gone over my head. He's feeling the weight. And David's illness is linked to his sin that will cause him to be humbled before the Lord and confess it. He says, Lord, this is too heavy for me. It's too heavy for me. And apart from Christ, we can't really, we don't have the capacity to bear these burdens. Evidently, there was some time, like Psalm 32, like Psalm 51, where, where David apparently maybe thought that it wasn't going to, he didn't confess this quickly. And now he's realizing He's feeling the weight. He's feeling the weight of the conviction. And he says, Lord, I can't take this any longer. I give this up to you. Verse 5, description of whatever this was that he had. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. He was covered with sores. They were all over his body. They were the cause of his wounds. Verse 6, I am troubled. That word troubled means he was bent. He was twisted with, with a sense of constant irritability. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. And, and David is weeping. He's weeping over his condition. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease. Literally, literally burning some intense fever, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble, faint, powerless, and sore broken, sore broken. I am completely crushed. I have roared by reason of the disquietness, the groaning, the grief, the anguish of my heart. And then in verse 9, Lord, all my desire is before thee and my groaning is not hid from thee lord you know it all you know it all and isn't that true he does know it all 
nothing that we can hide from him he says lord all my desire is before you my groaning is not hid from you your heart goes out to david what was it that he did that would bring about such severe consequences and he says now in verse 10 my heart pants it is actually it reads it is throbbing violently my strength faileth me don't forget david in his prime a warrior a warrior like few others and now his, his strength is failing him. How, how his sin is affecting even his physical strength. As for the light of my eyes, it is also gone from me. Verses 5 through 10 record for us tonight the brutal honesty of the reality of David's sickness and suffering. Sin and stinks sin corrupts it robs us of strength and here in verse 10 David's heart is pounding with regret now it's time that he's suffering the consequences of what he did and then in verse 11 not only was he suffering physically and mentally and emotionally, no doubt spiritually, look at the impact in verse 11. My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore, and my kinsmen stand afar off. Whatever it was that David did, we don't know. We can only speculate. Those closest to him were treating him, the language there, treating him like he was a leper. And so on top of all of that, there's loneliness. John Corson writes with profound wisdom these words. If you want to know who your friends, your real friends are, get into trouble and then see who's left. <laughs> we got two amens. <laughs> Three. Isn't that true? And yet, look at the cross. And look at how Jesus' disciples were not even there. Even his mother and the other women stood afar off. And for David, little did he know that the God that he is crying out to tonight could so relate to him because he knew that there would be a time when all of his closest loved ones would forsake him. But not only are they forsaking him, his family and his friends, then there's another category of people Verse 12, they also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they that seek my hurt speak mischievous things and imagine deceits all the day long. The word snares speaks of traps that are used to catch wild animals and birds. And here is David. He says, and there are people, on top of everything I'm going through, they're, they're laying these traps for me. They're, 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 they're laying these snares for me. All who hated David and wanted to see him dead set traps to catch him like an animal. Those who wanted to harm him and destroy him planned and plotted all day long. He says, but I, as a deaf man, heard not. And I was as a dumb man that openeth not his mouth. Remember Jesus when he was accused? He opened not his mouth. That's very hard to do, isn't it? When you're being accused, when you're being slandered. So hard to keep your mouth shut. You just want to. 
Mm. You want to set the score. Here's David. He says, I'm like a deaf man. Deaf man. I opened not my mouth. F.B. Meyer wrote, when we are buffeted and derided, the true attitude is our Lord's. As the dumb sheep before her shearers, he opened not his mouth. Verse 14. Thus I was as a man that heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs. But now notice hope. Hope in his suffering. Everyone else apparently forsook, forsook him, but not his God. His God is chastening him. His God is disciplining him, but his God is not forsaking him. He says, for in thee, O Lord, in thee, Jehovah, do I hope. You will hear, O Lord, my God. He knew that the Lord was there for him. And sometimes when you and I are at our worst, that's when the enemy lies to us, doesn't he? You know that the number one activity of the enemy, he's known as the, t the tempter. He's a, the angel of light. But his number one activity that he does day and night, he is the accuser of the brethren. And he's relentless. He doesn't stop. David says, Lord Jehovah, you are my hope. I think it's important to remember, saints, there may be times in our lives when others may turn away from you, when others may treat you like a leper, for good reasons, for no reasons. It happens to all of us. But the Lord Jesus promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. And one thing you can always count on, even in your worst, Emmanuel is always there. Always there. Here's David, even under the weight of dealing with the consequences of his sin, he understood, Lord, you're my hope. And I know that I can always come to you. The devil want, doesn't want you to remember that or know that. Verse 16, For I said, Hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slips, they magnify themselves against me. Whenever, whenever David misstepped, David was watched. He was watched like a hawk. He was a marked man. He was a man after God's own heart. And when he was in the spirit, oh, he, he was a warrior. But when he was in the flesh, oh my. Oh my. Disaster. And whenever David slipped, his enemies gloated over that. And that hurts. When there are people that just don't like you and love hearing bad news about you. And then they just gloat. And they laugh. Oh, good. They deserve it. Whatever it was that David had done isn't deserving of the hatred and the treatment that he was given. But that only reminds us of David's greater son, the Lord Jesus. <laughs> Boy, was he treated badly? <laughs> Without a cause. David says in verse 17, for I am ready to halt. I'm ready to collapse. My sorrow is continually before me. But then he says, I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. David does not merely admit his sin. He's troubled by it. And sooner or later, you and I will always be sorry for our sin because sin always brings sorrow. You see, because first, sin first and foremost dishonors and offends God. And what do we do? What do we do? The enemy just 
will, will accuse us, condemn us, make us feel filthy, tell us God doesn't want to have anything to do with us. Why did God send his son? For the very reason that David is writing Psalm 38. <laughs> You believe that? You see, there, there's a theology that it's kind of like sin light. You know, like um, sour cream light. All sin is bad, all sin is wicked. All sin is evil. And the thing of it is, is that we, we may all confess tonight we're sinners, but do we really, really want to get to the core of how sinful we are? How wretched we are? How depraved we are? Don't go there. Please don't go there. And here is David now. He's doing what John tells us to do. If we confess our sin, what is confessing? Confessing is agreeing with God whatever he calls sin. Call it what it is. Whatever it is. Call it what God calls it. If it's pride, call it pride. Don't say, well, Lord, I slipped up. We're not talking about walking on ice. We're talking about confessing to a, the living God. Now he's, he's he, he, but here's the thing. Here's, this is deliverance. <laughs> I'm confessing. That's it. That's it. And confession of sin cleanses us from the shame and the filth of sin. David here is, ex is experiencing godly sorrow that works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. In Psalm 32, David said, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid, as if we could. You see, that's an indication of how wicked we are. Well, if the lights are off and it's dark and no one else sees, then God doesn't see. He knows. But here's the thing. Here's the amazing thing about Calvary. The one who knows us best loves us most. Doesn't that blow you away? You know, if, if, if just the people in this room, if we, were to, if we were to piece together outwardly the worst moments in our life, we could have a we could we could um, have a movie and call Raymond the monster, Lou the monster, Mike the monster. Because that's what sin is. It's a monster, isn't it? Not once in thirty-five years has anybody ever said, "You know, Pastor Ray." A few times you've said, "Would would would um, you asked." Would you want your thought life or your attitudes to be recorded and, and there would be an audio and a video for everyone to see next Sunday? Uh-uh! You know why? I'll tell you why. That's why God sent his son. For that very reason. And so here's David. He's confessing his sin. In one of his uh, podcasts, Tim Keller wrote, quote, if we only confess but do not also find the sin repellent for how it grieves and dishonors God and destroys other, the sin will retain its power over us. You see, the mark of a true believer is not if they will fall, but when. We all do. To different degrees, different increments. Some far more measurable. But we all do. 
But when you're a true believer, when you have been regenerated, you're going to turn back to God. You're not going to make excuses for what you've done. You're going to call it what it is, and there's going to be a hatred for that sin, and you're going to be doing battle with that. You see, because now that we're born again, our new nature, well, let me put it this way, your nature will determine your appetite. You can have the appetite of a sheep or the appetite of a pig. Ever seen that... uh, Okay, this is, you guys need a little, you need a little light break here. You ever, you ever seen uh, during the sports events, they have the, 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 the Geico commercial, the raccoons eating the garbage? You ever see that? I love that commercial. I love those three raccoons. I go, man, that. <laughs> and and if, when you're not born again, you'll, you'll just eat garbage. You'll love garbage. You'll feed on garbage. And you will delight in it. Now, that doesn't mean that you and I will, can never fall or fail, but it, it's just not there anymore. The, you, you, you can't stand it. You don't want it. You say, God, I am a monster. Forgive me. A child of God like David may slip and fall into sin, but they're never going to stay there. You know why? Because your new nature craves for righteousness and holiness. But here's David. He says, my enemies are lively. They are strong. And they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. David, I can't imagine what he feels like. Can you imagine if David lived today with social media? By golly, what would they say about him on Facebook, Twitter, and whatever other devices they have? They also that render evil for good are my adversaries. Notice, because I follow the thing that good is. David is not only suffering from guilt, but from bodily pain, unjust accusations, similar to what Job was suffering from his three friends. But, you know, in verses 19 and 20, this thought came to me. When a godly person, a follower of Jesus, sins, boy, how the unsaved, how the wicked sees that opportunity to attack them. But notice, not because they hate sin, but because they hate godliness. And then David says, forsake me not, O Lord, my God. Be not far from me. Make haste to help me. Oh, Lord, my salvation. David reminds us of a truth that we so often ignore or forget or the enemy doesn't want us to remember when we're in the pits. Without God's help, we perish. We need his help. We can't be our own savior. And without the realization of our sinfulness, we'll never sense the need for a savior Psalm 39 one more to the chief musician even to Jeduthun a psalm of David now Jeduthun was one of David's musicians musicians not not magicians <laughs> musicians yeah that's right anybody that's you know wants Pastor Ray just says that Jeduthun was a magician. That'll be on Facebook tomorrow, right? Yeah. Now, what would you call these musicians, these leaders? We, we would call them today what? We would call them today worship leaders, like tonight, Jordan led us in worship. That would be like Jeduthun or Asaph. They were temple musicians. They, they were called into that area of ministry. And they led people. And some people's ministry, can you imagine this, was just to sing unto God day and night. What do you do for a job? Oh, I just praise God all day long. Imagine that. What do you do? I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, praise God, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Holy One, praise God, hallelujah. What do you do now? I'm at work. <laughs> Hardly, hardly, hardly. Psalm 39, oh boy. (laughs) It's a psalm that is really, reminds us of something that you're not 
as aware of until you reach certain ages, like the brevity of life. I was reading in Psalms that God promises us three, three score years plus 10. Well, he's given me one plus that, so I'm on borrowed time right now. <laughs> and I can tell you, there's a lot more t of my life in the rearview mirror on earth that, than in ahead of me. Solomon in Ecclesiastes wrote that all of life under the sun apart from faith in God is nothing. This psalm is the cry of David who is suddenly, we don't know how old he is, but he's suddenly feeling the, fut the futility and the shortness of his own time on earth. It's so true that the fall in Genesis chapter 3 introduced us to life as it is now where all creation is groaning and travailing. How many times have you, have you thought, you know, when I get to heaven, I'd like to have a conversation with God about a few things. Now, um, I haven't arrived, but the older that I get, I realize that's not a conversation I'm going to get in. But uh, this much I do, I want to find Adam and say, what were you thinking? That's what I want. I want to go up to Adam and go, Adam, what were you thinking, dude? Do you realize? That was the Adam bomb right there. That's it. And look what happened. And we're born into this world, groaning and travailing. You know, today was a beautiful day, sunny day. You know, sunny day. And I, and I was thinking. And this is creation groaning. This is creation travailing. I'm talking to my wife today at the phone. She goes, oh, sweetie, it's so beautiful down here. The ocean is so beautiful. And it is, but this is sinful. This is corrupted version. Wait till we step into the uncorrupted, the sinless version of heaven and earth. Oh, hallelujah. That's where we're headed. Man. Yeah, me either. Life is short. Death is sure. Sin the cause. And Christ is the cure. And it is true. I used to hear my grandparents say, boy, is time going by so fast? I go, what are you talking about? Now I'm saying that my grandkids are telling me that. <laughs> you know, but how often do you and I wrap ourselves in the false security blankets of IRAs or physical health, or there's a whole other plethora of counterfeit gods? things that we look to for security. Sad to say, there are so many people that spend so much of their time and emphasis securing their life on earth instead of setting their affection on Jesus Christ. They're thinking about where they will spend eternity. So David, in verse 1 of chapter 39, says, I said, I will heed or guard my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Now, there are those that believe that this psalm has in view the occasion that gave rise to David's confession in the previous psalm. But notice here, how much Scripture talks about the mouth the tongue words so much and David is concerned about what he might say before the wicked he says I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue I will keep my mouth with a muzzle God Help us. Help us, <laughs> please. Again, 
the Reformation Study Bible has a note that says emotional outbursts do not honor God. The believer needs to keep a careful watch of his tongue, for it can be the instrument of many sins. Particularly when under pressure, we must do everything to ensure that what we say is ordered by grace, pleasing to, other, pleasing to God, and edifying to others. Wouldn't it be great to put that on, on bumper stickers, a refrigerator, the rearview mirror? Of, well, you can't put it on the rearview mirror or you'll get a ticket. Lord, what, may what I say be ordered by grace, be pleasing to you, and edify others. How many times have you said something and then you've apologized for what you've said? <laughs> right? Yeah, we, we are, right? Chuck, praise God, we're getting better. And, and, and you know, and you do, Lord willing, you, you get wisdom the older you live on this planet. And so I realize when I'm getting riled up and I want to say something, if it's here at church, I'll just go to another room. And I just, or if it's at home, I'll just go to another room. Because I have sat with people that have confessed to me time and time again. You know, I wish I never said it. Well, why did you? And then some people want to draw it out of you. I'm not going to say something that I know that I'm going to regret. <laughs> so I'm not going to say anything at all. Well, that works for me. So you can just, just continue exploding. And <laughs> doesn't help. Words are powerful. You know that. Every one of us here tonight have had people speak words to us that have been so encouraging and so uplifting and so helpful, and, they've, and there's been people that have s spoken words to us that probably the negative words have impacted us more than the positive ones. And I don't even want to give you a specimen of what some of those words were because I don't want to get you to go there. And I don't need to go there. Verse 2, I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then spoke I with my tongue. And, and In other words, whatever the situation was, David says, the more I thought, the more it burned. He just wanted to get it out. I, I need to get it out. I need to get it out. What's, where's my, well, okay, I'm going to get it. I'm going to text Lou right now. Lou. What did David do? Who did he spew it out to? Lord. There you go. Jesus isn't going to put it on Facebook. <laughs> Jesus isn't going to take a microphone and have him says, Excuse me, planet Earth. Pastor Ray just said something to me. You won't believe it. Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. You know, life is short no matter how long we live. And David recognizes his own frailty. And he's asked, Scripture constantly is confronting us with these questions. What is the purpose of life? That's what man is trying to figure out. What is it that gives meaning to existence? Now, science, thank God for the good things that we benefit from, from science, but science doesn't have an answer to those questions. Education doesn't have the answer to those questions. Atheism and secularism certainly doesn't have the answer to those questions. But there is an answer. There is an answer. In him, Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus is the answer. Sometimes people ask me. They have all of these doubts that, that's, that they're bombarded with, with 
doubting scripture and, and all of these things. And Well, what about this and what about that? Or how can you be a Christian? I'm a Christian because of Jesus Christ. That's why I'm a Christian. That's why I'm a Christian. He is my reason. What's your reason for living? <laughs> right? Why are you here? What's your purpose in life? You see, the gospel, again, the gospel is so wonderful. It's so beautiful. It helps us to see things in perspective. It helps us to see beyond this brief time of mortality. My youngest grandson, the other night was over, and um, we're having a, a good time together. And he says, uh, he says, Papa, he wanted to get real serious. Papa, don't go to India. They have coronavirus over there. You know, of course, he's my little Anthony. And I says, Anthony, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm afraid of being out of the will of God. And I know it's the will of God that I go. Life is short. And every one of us has, has to have a purpose for living. What is it? You know, Jesus told the story of a man that just built barns and barns and bigger barns and bigger barns and bigger barns. And now, where am I going to spend my next million? And Jesus says, you fool, tonight, you're stepping into eternity. Now, we have to work. We have to be wise stewards. We have to live on this planet. God didn't save us to be lazy. But what are we here for? Why are we here for? What is our ultimate purpose? It's to live for God and to bring him glory. Look at verse 5. Behold, you have made my days as in hand breath, and mine age is as nothing before you. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. That word vanity means a puff of wind. You know, when you go outside in the winter and you go, there I go. <laughs> That's it. And then he says, Selah, stop. Think about that. Now, the, a hand breath was considered to be the width of the four fingers on one hand, or roughly four inches. In other words, our life is so short, isn't it? So short. A vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Now, notice, as I read verse 5, David declares here that every man at his best state is vanity. The prophet Isaiah says our righteousness, the best that we can do is a filthy rag. You know what that means? <laughs> we need a savior. <laughs> the best of us is still us. <laughs> At my best, I'm vain. My righteousness is a filthy rag. And there are people that actually think they're going to stand before God apart from Christ. You're going to look at them and go, oh, boy, you're so cute. You're so handsome. I'm just going to let you into my kingdom. No way. No way. But just think of the love of God for us. How much, this just us tonight, you and me in this room, how much grace and mercy and patience of God do we use on an hourly basis? <laughs> and yes, he loves us. You know, when we understand the, the reality of the gospel, justification, just doesn't mean that our sins are forgiven. In, 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 in biblical language, it means that because of our faith in Christ's sacrifice, we are, we, we're, we're clean, we're right, we're totally forgiven. God doesn't even see us. The handwriting of our sins, are, the handwriting of ordinances has been wiped out. Can you believe, that's it. Done, over, it's finished. 
But in this life, we're vain. You know, I, I love watching sports and the Weather Channel and the documentaries on nature, especially when they say, and this species lived 58 billion years ago. And I'm thinking, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Okay, oh man, okay, yeah. And I watch these athletes, they get paid millions of dollars to make a corner shot. Then they do it. And I go, you get paid $50 billion. You should be making that shot. And then you go, yeah. Right? Well, if we're so vain. We're so, we're by nature so vain. Yeah, and, and yet, what are we here for? To give glory to God. Look at verse 6. Wow, if, if God hasn't deflated my ego, yet surely every man walks in a vain show. <laughs> surely they are disquieted in vain. He heaps up riches and doesn't know who is going to gather them. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in you. You know, given that life is short and unpredictable, the only durable hope is faith in God. Apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, who reveals God, he is the image of God. He is the perfect expression of the Father on earth. He's the perfect expression on God of God on earth. Without faith in him, life has no meaning. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. Though a sinner who had failed miserably. And I would encourage you tonight, read Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. Let's read Hebrews chapter 11. Then read about those people in the Old Testament. And there's something that you'll notice. You, you won't notice their sins, the iniquities, the transgressions. They're not there. You know why? Because Christ bore those sins on the cross. And all that is mentioned is how they, by Abraham, Abraham, by faith, Enoch, by faith, Joseph, by faith, Moses, by faith. David, even though he failed, he really did not want to bring reproach to the Lord. Deep down inside, that's what grieved him. That when he sinned, when he failed, it grieved him how it affected others. He says in verse 9, I was dumb, I opened not my mouth because you did it. Remove your stroke away from me. I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. In other words, again, the discipline that he was going through. When you with rebukes does correct man for iniquity, you make his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity, Selah. It's amazing when you see people that at one time were so, you know, male or female, young and muscular and all are beautiful, and, and then you, they get wrapped up into some kind of sin and iniquity, and then you look at them, what happened to them? Verse 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, and a sojourner as all my fathers. In other words, David says, my time I know is short. The word stranger and sojourner reminds us that we're pilgrims, aren't we? We're pilgrims in this life. We are just passing through. But in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are promised that this earthly life is not the end. Regeneration is not the end. Regeneration is just the beginning. You and I tonight, we are on a journey towards a city whose builder and maker is God. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would tell you. That's where we're going. That's where we're going. 
That's the promise of Jesus Christ. And any promise is only good as the one making the promise. That's why it's so good to renew your mind. Renew our minds with the promises of God. Whatever he promises, he is going to, he's going to fulfill. And then he says, oh, spare me <laughs> that I may recover strength. David says, I don't, know how much, I don't know how much more life I have on this earth, Lord, but you, you spare me. Give me strength before I go, well, before you take me out of here. And isn't that your prayer? Okay, Lord, I don't know how much more time I have, but you just breathe into me. You breathe into me that strength, that power, that love, that passion. Uh, yeah, you might remember when, when uh, David and uh, no, Joshua and Caleb, they were given a promise of a mountain, and then uh, Joshua, Joshua was now, he was distributing the land, and 45 years after the promise was made, 45 years Caleb says to Joshua, he says, Caleb, do you remember what God promised us? Yeah, 45 years ago, he promised us this mountain. He goes, I'm 85 years old. Josh, give me that mountain. I ain't done yet. That's how you want to go out. I think it is so depressing when I see people retire and they have their... their their pants up here with a white belt. And those white socks, and they're playing shuffleboard. I'm thinking, God Almighty, God, if that's what's in store for me, take me now. And, and I'm at that age, I get, I get that mail now. I get the meals for, uh, for Alzheimer's, hearing, eyesight, everything. See, you're not there. Michael, you're, you're going to get them, Lord. If the Lord tarries, Michael, you won't laugh. You'll get them. They're coming to you. Yeah, you're on the list. AARP. <laughs> all, right, uh, uh, all right. You know, I think we should, we should probably end with singing tonight. Should we? Yeah, yeah. Guys, wherever you are, Jordan, are you still here? Oh, there you are. Yeah. yeah. I just, and then he says, O Lord, spare me that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. And I thought, who will the Lord spare and cause to recover their strength until he calls them home? Malachi 3, 16 through 18. Then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. Then you will return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves not. How do you can, what's one way you can tell between someone that's righteous and someone that's wicked? The righteous serve God. The wicked serve themselves. But I love how it says, they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another. Jordan and I gossiping to one another about Jesus. Did you hear what he just did? Are you kidding me? I'll one-up you. And you too, Dylan. Did you hear that? Did you hear how he just touched that person? Are you kidding that's, that's godly gossip. Couldn't we use a little bit of godly gossip around here? That's bragging about the Lord. I can't believe he's, he just saved that guy that I've been praying for for 10 years. Oh, oh, what a Savior. Isn't he good? Isn't he wonderful? Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. I was just talking to Mary. Where that guy been for 15 years, praying for this guy, and he came walking right through that back door, and there he comes right up to the front and goes, hey, Pastor Ray, I'm back. What are you doing here? Don't you just love bragging about the Lord, boasting about the Lord, talking about the Lord all day long? <laughs> it is so good. <laughs> it is so good. It, you, the more you brag about him, the less you're going to be talking about other things and other people. Life 
is short. Life is short. And yet, how many of us have experienced Psalm 38? How many of us have stepped into the reality of how short life is? Every time I go to the mailbox, Michael, I get, okay, here's another one, Alzheimer's. And I'm getting all of them now. And, and I throw them in the, the, the recycling bin. I don't want to show them to my wife. She's in there, how old are you? <laughs> do, you do they know something that I don't know? But at the end of the day, guys, I know it's getting late. At the end of the day, through thick and thin, David knew, as even at his worst moments, he says, Lord, I know you'll always be there, that I can always turn to you. Saints, if there's a takeaway, that's it. You don't think about it when things are well and when the wind is blowing in your back. But when things are bad, when times are low, when you're physically and mentally and emotionally and relationally feeling like you're tapped out, Jesus is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Jesus, thank you. Help us to number the rest of the days that we have. That we may be a people that live for you, that live for your glory. And forgive us for the times, Lord, that we do not redeem the time, that we spend the time on lesser things. We thank you that you're so gracious and so merciful and so kind and so compassionate. Lord, as we close with this song of praise, receive it. Be blessed by it. Be glorified in it. We ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, please.
again. God, you are with us. 